Okay, if I can call everyone to order and welcome everyone to this, the second meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2019. We have apologies from Rachel Hamilton and Maurice Corey is attending as committee substitute, so welcome, um, Maurice. We have one item on the agenda this morning, consideration of three continued petitions with evidence in each from the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport. Can I welcome you? Um, and may also welcome Emma Harper, MSP, who is attending for this petition. The first petition is Petition 1619, lodged by Stuart Knox, on access to glucose monitoring. The petition is calling for glucose monitoring sensors to be made available under prescription to all patients with type 1 diabetes. When this petition was last considered in June 2018, issues were raised relating to the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network, um, guidelines for type 1 diabetes management and the VAT element of Scottish Government funding for additional insulin pumps as well as continuous glucose monitoring devices. Responses have been received concerning these issues from the Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport. Um, for consider of this petition, the Cabinet Secretary is accompanied by Catherine Calderwood, the Chief Medical Officer, and Elizabeth Sadler, Deputy Director, Planning and Quality. Can I welcome the Cabinet Secretary and officials to the meeting, and I would invite you to provide a brief opening statement of up to no more than five minutes, after which we'll move to questions. Thank you very much, uh, convener, and good morning, uh, committee members. Uh, can I say at the start, I'm very grateful to Dr Calderwood for being able uh, to attend with me this morning, given all the other pressures on our diary. Uh, so uh, I'm grateful too to the committee for inviting me to give evidence uh, today in this uh, petition. As you will be aware from my letter of the 8th of August, the Scottish Health Technology Group published their advice statement on the flash glucose monitoring device Freestyle Libre on the 13th of July 2018. My letter at that time also stated that NHS boards uh, who had not yet included Freestyle Libre onto their local formulary were considering how to implement this advice to best effect. I can now provide an update to you this morning uh, that all NHS boards in Scotland have now included Freestyle Libre in their local formulary and are making it available on prescription. I expect all boards to make Freestyle Libre available to patients in line with clinical guidelines and in a phased and controlled manner in order to ensure that appropriate education is delivered prior to initiation and recognising challenges for the manufacturer to match demand. This will benefit many individuals across Scotland and I hope will reassure the committee that the spirit of the petitioner's concerns in relation to Freestyle Libre have now been met. At the meeting on the 28th of June last year, my officials clarified that Freestyle Libre is not a continuous glucose monitor. As more clinical evidence becomes available, Freestyle Libre is showing positive effects in improving quality of life by reducing the numbers of finger prick testing that patients require to self-manage their diabetes. However, Freestyle Libre is not suitable for some patients, in particular for those who have very limited or no hyperglycemic awareness. There is strong cl clinical evidence to demonstrate that CGMs have a positive impact for a small cohort of patients with frequent or severe hypoglycemia, improving glycemic control, reducing hypoglycemic episodes and emergency hospital admission. We will continue to provide NHS boards with additional funding specifically for continuous glucose monitors so that they will increase the number available to diabetes patients where that is clinically indicated. Finally, as you will be aware, diabetes remains a clinical priority for the Scottish Government and I want to reassure you that I am committed to ensuring that our health service continues to deliver care and treatment of the highest quality. I'm happy, convener, of course, to answer any questions your members may have. Okay, thank you very much for that and I think um, the committee would recognise that that's a, a very positive statement on, on the petition. Can I ask... You indicated, obviously, there's issues around training and you know, the time to, for this to work through the system. Do you have a, um, a sense, if not a target, of a sense by, by which time people who would benefit from this would be able to access it routinely across Scotland? So, so I don't have a, a target time. Um, as I'm sure committee members understand, um, 
there needs to be that, uh, I'm sure Dr Calder would may want to say more here, um, there needs to be that uh, clinical uh, judgment about the appropriateness of freestyle Libre for a particular patient, uh, a bit of initiation uh, then and education with that patient. Uh, and of course, that all has to happen, if you like, at the secondary care level. Uh, but once that is uh, undertaken, then the prescription will come from uh, the individual's uh, primary uh, caregiver, if you like. Um, so it, it is a phased introduction, but it is led by um, the numbers of individuals for whom this would be appropriate and doing the necessary, if you like, two steps uh, before we get into regular prescribing for that individual. I don't know, though, in terms of uh, how that may pan out, whether Dr Calderwood wants to say anything else. So we know that some of our health boards have come on stream very recently with availability of Freestyle Libra. There are a, a group of patients for whom it's, it's going to very obviously be the best choice and something that they, in fact, may have been looking forward to having the opportunity to use. So there, there's a period of training for the patients. They need to attend um, and, and be, ensure that they are able to use the device and members of their family also but once that um, training is undertaken, then the, the prescription and they're, they're able to go ahead. There would be a group of patients then for whom there might be some uh, additional work needing to be done as to whether actually it might be uh, the right thing for them, but they might need um, a longer time to perhaps until they actually moved forward to changing to using Freestyle Libra. So I think what, w what we're saying is that it's now available across Scotland in all our health boards. There will be some um, clinical differences in, in length of time to people changing over. It's not for everybody, but, but there's, there's now no impediment to those patients for whom it's the right uh, way to monitor their um, glucose levels to be able to use it. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, uh, convener. Good morning, um, Cabinet Secretary. Um, clearly, I welcome the announcement this morning as well, having had a number of constituents have approached me with regard to Freestyle Libra and uh, also the uh, visit that the uh, committee made to Dumfries and Galloway uh, some time ago. Uh, the, the, the benefits of Freestyle Libra were, were brought to our attention. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, Cabinet Secretary, in your opening remarks, the clinical guidelines. Um, now, the, the committee's previously heard evidence that sign guidelines uh, for type 1 diabetes management are out of date uh, and have not been uh, kept up to date with technology. And the committee understands that these guidelines will be withdrawn in 2020 rather than reviewed or updated. Um, so we'd be keen to hear uh, wh how, how you would respond to that point, but also um, Evidence received by this committee has confirmed that there are proposals in the pipeline for guidelines relating to type 2 diabetes uh, to begin being updated this year. So why are there no similar plans or proposals to update the sign guidance for the management of type 1 diabetes? So, um, as, as you um, indicated, Mr MacDonald, uh, the technology is moving so fast that the, uh, by the time the guidelines are updated, they are potentially out of date. So, what is, we're looking to do, or what is being looked to do, uh, is more rapid technical assessments, uh, for example, in uh, glycemic control in, in type 2. Uh, I know that Professor Leach, uh, in his letter to the committee, uh, offered uh, an explanation of that. Um, the, there is, a, the, as I say, the, the question of, uh, oh, the, by the time you update the guidelines, they are themselves out of date. So what needs to be looked at is um, what, what system can you have uh, that keeps pace with technology while still offering the right guidance uh, to clinicians? And um, I think Dr Calder would want to add on that. Um, so the, the sign guidance, guidance has, has really changed into their approach. So this is not specific to this particular diabetes guideline. So what was happening was that the sign guidelines were being updated for everything every three years. Sometimes there was no change because there was no more research, but sometimes there was so much change it was, they were out of date. So what that um, guideline committee has undertaken is a complete change in the way that they are going to do the guidelines. They're going to retire guidelines that are um, the older ones, 
and uh, the call has now come for much more focused guide guidelines rather than something that would take years and years and years to produce. So I think with this new technology, what we would be looking for would be the Scottish Diabetes Group would put forward a proposal to sign with a very narrow focus. The, the, the new procedures in sign mean that that then is turned around very rapidly. They might have a Scottish Health Technologies Group assessment of the technology, and then the guidance would look at a very um, quick production of something that was clinically relevant at that time. So, so it's, it, it's for the... Um, Scottish Diabetes Group in this new world where we have Freestyle Libra to put forward proposals to sign. What they're saying is they will take on X many per year, but they're a focused piece of work which are produced much more rapidly and I think I would argue in, in agreement with them, much more clinically relevant than something that takes three or four years to produce. Okay, thanks for the clarification. That's helpful. So that would apply to anything with modern technologies? I mean, presumably modern technology is now applying across the landscape in terms of um, medicine. So are we saying basically in the long and medium term, sign guidelines are not going to be relevant? No, no. no I, do, I don't think that is what uh, Dr. Cole would or the, 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 the uh, guidelines committee is saying. I think what they're recognising um, is that um, for, for... So this doesn't apply to everything, but there are uh, uh, areas where technology is very relevant and is moving quickly, and therefore the Guidelines Committee have recognised that and said that, that they need to uh, alter the way in which they undertake their work so that they can keep pace with that technology. So, so in the past, taking two, three years to update guidelines um, was adequate. But now, for in some instances, that, that is too long and would end up being out of date and is a significant, in effect, waste of effort. Uh, so now it would be for those uh, where it is appropriate, that much more focused piece of work that tries to keep pace with the speed of technological developments in medicine, uh, but also is clinically then relevant uh, and our guidelines then that actually make... Uh, add value uh, to the clinicians and to the decisions they have to take. In the meantime, there are going to be no sign guidelines for type 1 diabetes. I wonder how you decide across the board which, which areas are, are subject to this fast technology and other areas that are not. I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. presumably there's some kind of rational way of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, people who, you know, the petitioner has felt they need to bring a t petition forward in order to get health boards to catch up with technology, I wonder what reassurance you can give people across the board that there's some kind of rational process for doing mm -hmm. this. Uh, so so the, or the original sign guidelines we're talking about were, were uh, written in 2010. So I think that what, what we're looking at at the moment is something that, that needed to move on. We would expect the Scottish Diabetes Group to feed into sign as I've described, but in the meantime, because we've got this new technology, we would, we would be working with boards through the Scottish Diabetes Group to make sure that, that first of all, where patients should be having this technology, they're having access to it, and also monitoring, of course, the use, the uptake, and, and if there are any problems. The um, prioritisation that sign is, is is looking at. They have a, a, a work stream over a number of, of years. I couldn't tell you exactly what, what, which and what order things are coming forward in. But the, the idea is that we are, we are not in Scotland relying on guidance that is then years out of date with new research coming uh, behind it that isn't then looked at. So this is um, in common with the, the way that guidelines are being produced across the rest of the UK, a much more rapid process. But the Scottish Diabetes Group is key here for us. Yeah, I, I don't think we're, it's necessarily addressing the point I'm concerned about whether are we up across the board having signed guidelines, do they matter anymore? Or what happens in other bits of the system? But that's maybe something, forgive me, maybe I'm, I'm digressing a bit just in terms, but in terms of the diabetes issues, there is another means by which folk are um, being guaranteed that modern technology has been recognised and their access to 
the appropriate um, support is available. So it's maybe something that we can come back to. I'm um, me digressing a note. You. So, Convener, sorry, be, before you move on, uh, it is um, uh, an important digression, though, and if it would be helpful, then we will um, pull together the information in direct response to uh, the issues you're raising and send that on to the committee about how the Guidelines Committee is going about its work. I think, um, just though for the record, um, I think it is important to be clear that sign we are not saying, and neither is the Guidelines Committee, saying that sign guidelines are no longer relevant. They are. It's the manner in which the, com the Guidelines Committee go about producing them that they uh, have looked to uh, change and improve on in order to match the pace with which uh, all of this is moving forward. But we'll pull something together okay. and make sure the committee has that. That would be helpful, because I think, looking at it externally, if you're somebody with type 1 diabetes, you may be thinking... Your issues are being deprioritised if there's no longer going to be guidelines available. But I think that would be really helpful. Um, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Gavina. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and, and to the panel. I think we would recognise that since this petition has been brought forward, there's undoubtedly been uh, certainly advancement in, in, uh, in CGM and also the knowledge uh, that uh, has been brought to the fore of what that can actually do. Uh, for those who uh, have the condition type one and maybe even type two, but I was going to ask in. in July 2018, the, the Scottish Health Technologies Group published uh, an advanced statement on freestyle Libra flash glucose monitoring, recommending its use among adults that manage the condition with that multiple uh, daily insulin injection or insulin pump therapy, and concluded that it was good value for money. Uh, so, based on these findings, uh, what is the Cabinet Secretary's view as to the current level of Scottish Government funding available to health boards for this technology? So the, the, the funding that is available to health boards is, in my view, uh, adequate to uh, the demand that they have. Um, as they uh, shift where it is clinically appropriate to Freestyle Libre, of course, um, they, there are other uh, areas that they have been uh, using their resources for, for example, uh, finger prick testing. Uh, kits that they no longer uh, need to use for those individuals uh, and so uh, they'll be able to uh, manage their resource between uh, what is uh, has been available up until now and the introduction of that new technology. We have also, of course, um, as a government, provided uh, additional funds, as I said in my statement, and we will continue to do that. I think what, you know, moving forward, I think what the, 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 the public would be looking for is some sort of uh, consistency uh, of, of application and how, and how we reach that. I mean, I heard just this morning that in the Highlands, for example, there's only four uh, units uh, that are actually available, and they're being given out and used, uh, as I understand, to uh, the youngest patients. Uh, for the youngest patients, which kind of goes against what the Scottish Health Technologies Group uh, are, are recommending. So how do we get to a, a situation where... You know, the, those who are suffering from uh, type 1 diabetes currently um, would understand where they sit within the, their ability to access this kind of technology because there doesn't seem to be that sort of a consistency of application across all health boards. So I, I'm going to ask Ms Sadler um, to respond to some of, of what you said, but I should say that NHS Highland uh, were the, the last board uh, to come on stream here. Uh, and so in terms of how they go through that phased introduction that Dr Calderwood uh, explained, uh, they, they are uh, later than some other boards uh, and need to do some work in order to ensure that uh, they catch up in terms of the availability for um, of patients for whom this is appropriate. But I think Ms Sadler may want to add some additional information to that. So um, Freestyle Libra and... Um, continuous glucose monitoring are two um, separate things, which do, but they produce a similar thing. So Freestyle Libra is now available on prescription across Scotland, um, with NH Highland coming on board for that earlier this week. So um, that <coughs> will be a clinical decision taken by the individual and the clinician whether the that is a suitable technology for an individual. Continuous glucose monitoring is a more invasive um, device that is actually um, somebody wears um, and it, it goes into their body 
Um, that is particularly suitable for people who have um, very poor hypoglycemic um, control and particularly for people who have no awareness um, of the fact that they are about to have a hypo or a hypo episode where it happens very suddenly. And what um, a continuous glucose monitor, monitor does is actually alert the person that that is about to happen. The Scottish Government have provided additional funding of £2 million a year um, over the last few years to support boards to provide an increase in the number of um, insulin pumps and CGM monitors. Um, that money is allocated on the basis of um, need and um, clinical decision making. And um, my, the numbers I have is that uh, for over 18s, nine people in Highland have CGM. Um, and I, that's for over 18s. I don't have a number for under 18s. Um, and, but that is being rolled out in conjunction with um, individuals and their clinicians. Some people are now choosing to have Freestyle Libra um, rather than a pump um, because um, the Freestyle Libra is a less invasive procedure and that does also help them to con um, understand what's happening with their um, sugar controls. But they are actually two different things. Thank you. Yeah. Um, presumably, then, uh, you know, uh, given that, that health boards are not all adopting the, the technologies all at the same time, there's, a, there's, there's an ability across health boards then to share that learning from from, the, from early adoption. Absolutely. Um, and um, of, um, sorry, in. Um, so we have, um, we understand across Scotland there are 200, around 250 people who have CGM monitors um, and those will be, um, that will be increased over time um, and we think that's probably reaching roughly 50% of the people who would potentially be benefit from a monitor. But clearly some people who would benefit from a CGM monitor may decide that it, in conjunction with their clinician that they don't actually want to have it. Mm -hmm. So... Um, we are making good progress and we are committed to giving more money in 1920 and have just written to the boards to ask them um, about the progress they've made in 1819 and then we will then take decisions on the allocation of funding for next year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's funding for this April. Continuous glucose monitoring and monitors and insulin pumps. So Freestyle Libra will be, is funded by boards through their prescription through prescription. We don't know yet what the allocation is in January for decisions in April. Well no, but the, the, the funding is in the draft budget. Right. Uh, and so uh, so the funding is there in the draft budget and we then uh, have boards come forward um, and tell us what their particular needs are um, so that we can then allocate from that funding to the boards in order to meet their particular need. And it may vary uh, depending on where they have got to uh, in terms of provision in this financial year and therefore what more they need to do in the next financial year. OK, so they have to bid in? They, they simply have to advise us. What, it's not a bid. They simply have to advise us uh, what uh, their need is and, and show us... Uh, their evidence of where they've progressed to so far and therefore the need for the coming year looks like X or Y, uh, and then we allocate that fund out from the pot that is already in the draft budget. OK, thank you. Maurice Corey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and panel. Um, it's certainly what we're hearing this morning, some good news um, coming forward. Um, but bear in mind your statement, uh, Cabinet Secretary, just now about uh, how fast technology is moving, as you say. Um, the Scottish Health Technologies Group advises that further research into the long-term use and use with children and young people is needed. How is the Scottish Government uh, going to respond to these findings in relation to the technology moving forward and how does it intend to explore this issue further? Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, Mr Corey. I think you and I have corresponded on this uh, in the past in terms of particular constituent yeah. interests. So, uh, I, I hope that what we've said this morning is helpful oh, certainly, uh, for certainly that. Helpful, I'm yeah. going to ask uh, Dr Calderwood to pick up the point on research. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Corey. I think the point really is that we must try to ensure that all patients who would benefit from these new technologies are, are getting them. There is caution, of course, at first, which is why that we have some restriction. It's, it's at the moment Freestyle Libre recommended for people over 18, not recommended for people on dialysis, for example, or for um, pregnant women. But we know that there would be many young people who are below the age of 18 for whom, of course, it would be the right thing to do. The, um, the CSO, the Chief Scientist's Office, is under my jurisdiction in Scottish Government. We have a, a very, uh, the, in fact, we're the envy of the rest of the UK in our ability to turn around application for grants and have that funding available. We have a 30-day turnaround from submission to a decision for, um, for money to be given. So if we have... A, um, particular interest in something and, and I would say that this is new in Scotland we have a, a whole country coverage this is absolutely the right sort of um, study that we should be proposing so interested anyone can come forward of course but what we would be doing would be approaching the Scottish diabetes group to to who of course have contacts with our researchers across Scotland and beyond people with an interest um, uh, Dr Keenan, my specialty advisor in diabetes, for example, who has been to this committee before, and putting forward proposals so that we would have um, research that is happening as we get this coverage on board, with a view, of course, to spreading it to other patient groups if that was thought to be appropriate. So, so you're finding that this is useful? It's obviously giving you some leads and some steers and to what to do about it? Is, is, is it there, giving you some steers, the research that's coming forward, the, uh, the results of that? Is, is it giving some steers towards how we deal with the younger people? So I think that at, at the moment we're, there, there are very small numbers of younger people who would mm -hmm. be on an, a very individual basis with a clinician who knows that young person very well because at the moment I, I don't think we're using it in Scotland in, in, in many, if any, younger people because at the moment it's not recommended. Yeah. What we need to do is look at a case-by-case -case basis, but as, we, as this technology spread not only in Scotland but across the UK yeah. and beyond, there will be numbers coming forward. And, and the, the, the evid when we have an evidence base or begin to, um, we, the, the ability then to think that this is a technology that's going to be safe and effective mm -hmm. in other groups of people, we would of course use it. Use it. May I just ask one quick question, Cabinet Secretary? Does that mean we've, you've built into your draft budget, uh, you know, proposal funding to have these projects go forward? Well, the, the Chief Scientist Office has a, a, an allocation right. uh, within the draft budget, and it is for the Chief Scientist Office to determine uh, how they use that based on the research proposals that come forward. Right. Um, and, and that is um, quite rightly, if you like. The, the decision uh, of those with that uh, scientific and medical expertise and not the decision for someone like me. What, what I do is make sure that in the overall draft budget for this portfolio, there is the appropriate allocation uh, to that office to undertake that work and, and they then deal with that um, according to their uh, assessment of the various research proposals that come forward. So, so what we're saying in this instance, in terms of under 18, if, if I uh, am uh, getting this correct, is that for individual mm -hmm. under 18 year olds, it is a case by case clinical decision now, uh, based as uh, Dr. Calderwood said, on the clinician's knowledge and, and relationship and understanding of that individual. Um, so, so that is possible in, in, a, in a way it's not uh, so different an approach from the way uh, we do with uh, the PACS approach, for example, mm -hmm. on uh, uh, drug prescribing. Yeah. Uh, but parallel to that, with the Scottish Diabetes Committee uh, and the Chief Scientist Office, research proposals that look to build on that evidence and, and more, uh, more globally, uh, will be looking at the research base uh, on which decisions might be taken uh, to widen access to under 18 year olds. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank uh, you, Chair. David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, NHS boards have been asked to accurately record the introduction of all diabetes devices into Scottish <coughs> Care Information Diabetes Collaboration System. Can you confirm that this data is being recorded by all NHS boards and is there any potential challenges to NHS boards? Um, I I am uh, not aware of any potential challenges to NHS boards. None have been raised with me. 
uh, and my understanding is that they are undertaking that work. I'm very happy um, if the committee would find it helpful um, for us to do uh, a quick uh, um, uh, look round all the boards uh, and get them to uh, advise us as to where they, where they are in that piece of work so that the committee has that additional assurance. Thank you. Okay. Um, I wonder if I just very briefly ask this question about, you know, you're going to deliver these devices and the issue about costs. There was an issue about um, health boards being given an allocation, but it turned out that the, what, it wasn't funding the VAT costs associated. And I know we got an explanation which was average and all that kind of stuff, which is frankly less than compelling. I wonder if we just get a commitment that, or recognition, that if you're going to say we're going to deliver X number of devices, you actually have to will the means for that to happen and that this issue about VAT will be addressed? So, so you, you do have that commitment from me. I, I don't see any point in uh, uh, embracing uh, improved technologies where they are clinically appropriate and, and not making sure that as far as we possibly can, then we allocate the, the resources in order uh, for that to be to be delivered to the patients for whom it is appropriate. Um, the, the issue around VAT uh, and so on um, is, is one that, as you say, um, uh, Professor Leach uh, responded to in, in his uh, letter. Um, and uh, I have nothing more to add to what he said in terms of uh, how that was approached. Of course, if as we uh, progress uh, through uh, this work uh, and boards, uh, I, I would assure the committee, boards are never slow in uh, coming to me if they feel that they have not been given uh, the adequate resource that they need uh, for a specific piece of work and we always look at that. But you've accepted the general principle that the cost of something um, it includes in general terms what it's going to cost the health board to get it, so um, if you're not funding the VAT element of it, it's, it's reducing the number. No, I don't accept that because I think, as, as we tried to explain earlier, and I'm very happy to uh, offer further written explanation on this, uh, boards uh, have an overall allocation in terms of prescribing. Um, and uh, as uh, uh, more and more individuals uh, use or switch from, uh, for example, uh, the finger-pricking test kits to uh, Freestyle Libra, then there is a, a shift in... Um, how that resource is used away from one uh, and towards another. Uh, and uh, our uh, view is that overall, that will allow boards to continue to manage the resource within uh, the allocation that they have within their draft budget. Now, if boards, uh, as they go through the next financial year, and of course, assuming that the current draft budget becomes the budget, uh, and therefore what I have uh, remains uh, as it is currently planned, then as they go through the year, where boards believe that they are um, uh, having difficulties in meeting all the demands within their overall prescribing budget, then they do, of course, raise that directly with us, and we look with them at what more could be done to assist them. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Emma Harper? Thank you, convener, um, and uh, thank you for keeping me up to date with... Uh, the Petition Act Committee. Um, I do need to declare an interest because I'm the co-convener of the Diabetes Cross Party Group and I'm a type 1 pump user and a freestyle Libra user as well. So um, I'm interested just to clarify that uh, routine finger stick um, testing or finger prick testing is still required when people are using Freestyle Libra. And sometimes there is a variability in the results because Freestyle Libra is interstitial uh, glucose monitoring and not blood glucose monitoring. So that raises issues with driving and the competence to drive and assessment requirements as well. So it's just to clarify that uh, finger stick readings are still required because they're not always accurate or we want to make sure that there is accuracy. But I'm also curious about a couple of additional things is um, what work has been done with the DVLA to move forward the uh, acceptance of um, freestyle Libra or continuous glucose monitoring because it is interstitial testing and not blood glucose because that's what currently is, uh, is required, I think. Um, and then the other thing is it's about children. Um, you clarified, Cabinet Secretary, that uh, children who might have 
type 1 diabetes, unawareness of hypo, seizure activity at night, they may benefit from Freestyle Libra, but that would be a requirement that they would work with their GP or their specialist doctor and do a person-centred approach for the kids to have that, because that has been raised with me at the cross-party group, as well as with constituents as well. I'm going to ask Dr Calderwood to respond in terms of, of uh, children. So, so I think that they, they, you're absolutely right, the, it's, it's the individual, and sometimes, as you uh, be aware from your cross-party group, the, the continuous glucose monitoring, in fact, might be more appropriate for a child than freestyle Libra. So I think at the moment, as with, as with many new technologies and, of course, with many medications, that the, the initial body of evidence is from adults, and we then creep, if you like, because of individuals into, into expanding the indications. The, the, the really important um, aspects here are that those individuals are well known to their clinicians, that their condition is well known, that the risks and benefits of any new treatment that isn't in, hasn't got a body of evidence in that particular age group, it, so that the safety aspects, of course, are covered. But I think we know that um, continuous glucose monitoring and, and the flash glucose mon monitoring that Freestyle Libra affords and the insulin pumps are of great benefit to children uh, for, for all the reasons you'll know yourself. But we, we haven't got, a, um, a, I suppose, the, the, the numbers at the moment to be able to point to big studies that, that say that this is the right thing to do, but that, that will come in time in Scotland and, and obviously we can learn from the literature across the world. Mm -hmm. So on, on the DVLA question, so the DVLA um, require um, sufficient evidence that um, the glucose is, the glucose is monitoring is sufficiently controlled, or glucose levels are sufficiently controlled, and they require that on a UK level. So we're an, a, a relatively at a UK level, very early stage in being able to produce that evidence for them. But as that becomes available, then it will be submitted and DVLA will be asked to consider uh, their approach in, in the light of that. Right, so currently people need to provide evidence of adequate blood glucose management using finger stick device because we're not at the point yet where they will accept Freestyle Libre results or CGM results. Exactly. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Brian Whittle. Um, thank you, Gavina. I should have, I should have uh, declared also that I was a co-convener of the diabetes cross-party group, so apologies, uh, apologies for that, Gavina. I think just to follow on what um, Emma Harper was saying, then one of the things that... We heard in evidence and how this technology um, it, it's got a compelling argument for the potential for children uh, in the evening, the sleep patterns in the evening, not having to wake them up uh, to do fingerprint testing. And, and I think that uh, and that's something that has raised it, it has been raised time and time again within the cross party groups. I think that's that's certainly an area of con concern and hope, I think, for, for a lot of people with, with children with that condition. I think what I wanted to ask really was is there any more work being done around? potential long-term savings uh, to the budget of this kind of, of the introduction of this kind of technology, not just in, in uh, not using the current kits that are available, but the long-term are saving where we can prevent those with these conditions from sliding into other more costly uh, costly treatments. And, uh, you know, that obviously in the preventative health agenda is really where we want to be. So is there any long-term uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, con con consideration being given to, to budget. So it's, it's, a, it's a really important point, um, I think, Mr <coughs> Whittle, and I appreciate you asking it. Um, uh, in terms of uh, our analysts and, and where we uh, can access the um, resources of economic analysts, uh, I am keen that in a number of areas uh, across our work that we look um, to begin to develop some of that, if you like, cost-benefit approach um, and link that to the preventative agenda. I do think that the preventative agenda um, needs um, uh, a reinforcement of that type. Um, uh, it, it feels to me too often in terms of the preventative work, whilst we all understand, I'm sure in this room, the absolute importance of that, uh, it can feel uh, elsewhere as uh, nice to have if we can manage it, but let's just deal with what's immediately in front of us. Uh, and I think that there needs to be um, a stronger base, if you like, for the case. Uh, so I have begun some discussions about um, where we might look to um, initiate and have that work, not 
not always necessarily from inside Scottish Government. We have a number of our major academic institutions uh, who have a keen interest in uh, some, of the, some of these health areas uh, and a lot of expertise in doing that kind of economic analysis. So we're currently uh, considering how we might uh, identify the areas that we would want uh, some joint work on and move that forward. Okay. Uh, and again, um, as, we, as we progress those uh, discussions, I'm very happy uh, to ensure that certainly Mr Whittle, but the committee more widely, if they're interested, are uh, informed of how we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Just a wee brief question. Um, at the cross-party group for diabetes, we had a gentleman who had lost seven stones in weight, but he used the Freestyle Libra and self-funded and used that as part of social prescribing, family support. And it got to the point where it doesn't take any of his type 2 diabetes meds anymore. So um, there is, a, a, I suppose, an application for the likes of Freestyle Libra for people if they choose to do that. But we would encourage them to you know, use different approaches like social prescribing and uh, uh, family support as well. So is there a, a move or a, any, any research progressing for type 2s with this kind of monitoring? I think that because the technology has been introduced in, in, in the first instance for people with type 1 diabetes, that, that, ha that there, are, there aren't the numbers. I suspect there are people like that gentleman all dotted around across the UK. The, the difficulty would be having a, the numbers to do research that would, would be statistically effective. I, I absolutely, though, agree that, that all sorts of different methods, including what he has done, are, of course, the, the right thing to, to approach. We, we probably would take quite some time before there would be enough um, interest as well in researching in that area. But we, we start with something that has, shows a lot of promise. I think we will really get the benefits, and including the economic benefits Mr Whittle's talking about. And so the, inevitably, given that our numbers of people with type 2 diabetes, that I, I think, again, that the use of these technologies will spread further as we have more information and, and that the safety and benefits. Um, we've also got some additional information in terms of our overall investment in work to help people uh, in terms of their diet and nutrition. Uh, and Ms Sadler will give you that now. Um, so as part of our, um, we, we published a uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes prevention framework um, last year. And uh, to support the implementation of that, um, we investment of around £42 million over the next five years, which is aimed specifically at people who have been recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes or who are at high risk of type 2 diabetes um, to support them uh, to lose weight and to improve and to change their lifestyle um, to support a healthier living, um, to see if there is a possibility of potentially reversing the type 2 diabetes or um, reducing the rate at which the complications for the type 2 diabetes happen, which then obviously keep people healthier for longer. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. Just one very brief question, finally. Can, um, the committee understands that NHS boards are currently being supported by a part-time continuous glucose monitoring diabetes specialist nurse. Um, and we wonder if you could confirm the remit and scope of this role as well as describing how the impact of this role is being measured. Is it something you would see developing? So is this in the, from the group? There's no support. So um, the purpose of this role is to um, go around the boards and to work with them um, to support teams to identify who the most appropriate people are for, um, for technologies to support the um, learning um, and the education that individuals need before that they're able to um, to be prescribed um, either a pump CGM or now Freestyle Libra. Um, this post is relatively new um, and at the moment is going to last for three years. I, I'm not aware of any formal evaluation that we've done on that. Um, what I do know is that it's um, proving very helpful in supporting boards and that boards welcome um, the, the additional help and support that they're getting from this individual. Okay, I suppose given, I think, what's quite a significant statement about access to the technology and the recognition that has to be rolled out, but the commitment of the Scottish Government to do you think a part-time person for the whole of Scotland is sufficient to do that bit of groundwork that then liberates access to the technology? Of course, they're doing it with what 
the, what boards already have by way of uh, clinically skilled and uh, uh, professionally expert teams working in this area of diabetes. So they are, in effect, uh, providing uh, that addi additional support to that. So we, we mustn't uh, allow anyone to think that all that's happening here is a part-time uh, resource. Uh, and they are also, in terms of, I can't recall uh, which member asked a question about sharing good practice. I think it, it may, may perhaps have been Mr Whittle uh, about the sharing of good practice between those boards who uh, adopted uh, Freestyle Libra into their local formulary earlier than others uh, in order to help uh, others uh, benefit from that early learning. So at this point, uh, we uh, have had uh, no indication from boards that they require an additional resource to that three-year commitment uh, and uh, a lot of um, uh, support and uh, uh, feedback from boards that this is proving very helpful to them. Okay, so presumably in the normal run of things you would look at whether this was the best use of, of that resource given perhaps the Cabinet Secretary's suggestion that actually that kind of work has been done anyway. No, no I, I, think, I think my... Apologies if uh, I've led to uh, that misunderstanding. I'm, I didn't say this kind of work is being done anyway. What I said was that individual boards already have groups of people who are clinically and professionally expert in the area of working in diabetes and with patients with both type 1 and type 2. This is an additional resource to them in terms of uh, helping them uh, with the, these new technologies uh, now um, as uh, Ms Sadler said, uh, it's early days as it works out over the three years. There will be some evaluation work done as to uh, whether or not more uh, is needed beyond the three years, but it is an additional resource in order to help uh, boards with uh, new, these new technologies uh, to what they already have in terms of that board-based expertise. Okay. Thanks very much, and that, that, that's useful clarification. I think we've finished questions. But thank you very much for responding to that. I think people would feel that's a, a very positive um, statement and, and contribution from the Cabinet Secretary in terms of what the petitioner is, is looking for. And I think what we might want to do is reflect on the evidence. We may get the opportunity for the petitioner and others maybe to respond to what they've heard, and then we can draw a final conclusion. Would that be fair? Okay, in that case, yeah, so we will um, take an opportunity to reflect on the evidence of the very, I think, positive um, evidence we've heard today. Those with an interest in the petition will be able to make further submissions and then we can come to conclusions about the petition itself. But just to thank the Cabinet Secretary very much um, for answering our questions in that one. If we can now move on to the next petition, which is Petition 1629, lodged by Jennifer Lewis on MRI scans for ocular melanoma sufferers in Scotland. This petition is calling for ocular melanoma sufferers to receive MRI scans of the liver to detect early onset of metatastic disease of the liver for patients with ocular melanoma. The petitioner and Ian Galloway, who we have previously taken evidence from, have been consistent in outlining what they consider to be the advantages of people receiving MRI scans with colour contrast rather than a straightforward ultrasound scan. Members also have a copy of the most recent submission received from Ian Galloway, which expands on these concerns. The Cabinet Secretary is once more accompanied by the Chief Medical Officer and Elizabeth Sadler. And I would um, invite the Cabinet Secretary to provide a brief opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, convener, and again, I'm grateful to you and the committee for the opportunity to give evidence on this uh, petition today. I know, uh, as you say, it has been open for some time. So while ocular melanoma is a rare cancer, it is important that those with this disease are treated with equal importance to those who have more common cancers. In Scotland, the disease is managed through our National Services Division at the National Specialist Scottish Ophthalmic Oncology Service at Gartnavel General Hospital in Glasgow under the direction of two clinical oncologists, Dr Paul Couchy and Dr Vikas Chadda. Both have advised Scottish Government ministers and officials throughout this petition. I understand that at the time of lodging this petition, the petitioners were concerned that people with this condition in England were offered MRI liver scans, but that those in Scotland were not. 
I am advised that there has never been a difference between England and Scotland in this regard. However, the clinical community do recognise that there is variation in whether MRI scans are offered between different NHS regions and departments across the UK. The current situation across the UK, including in Scotland, is to follow the melanoma focus guidelines that were approved by NICE in January 2015. These advise that anyone with ocular melanoma should be offered six monthly screening of the liver using non-ionizing radiation. The most appropriate and commonly used imaging method in this case is ultrasound. It is my understanding that anyone living in Scotland who is diagnosed with an ocular melanoma will be initially treated by ophthalm ophthalmology specialists at Gart Naval Hospital, Dr Couchy and Dr Vikas. Follow-up is provided under the direction of those specialists at local centres and is planned in, cons in consultation with the patient. During follow-up, those assessed at low risk of developing uh, metatastic disease are offered ultrasound scans, usually at their local hospital, with any abnormalities being followed up using MRI. But at a UK and a Scottish level, there is not a clinical consensus for those at high risk. For all, imaging is undertaken. For those at high risk, additional Im imaging, including MRI, is undertaken as clinically indicated. Should a metatastic disease be found, then care is transferred back to an oncologist specialising in that particular organ for the delivery of systemic therapy. MRI is not routinely used for all people. The primary reason is patient safety. MRI delivers a dose of radiation, therefore regular imaging in itself can be a risk. The second reason is that the guidelines do not specifically state that MRI should be used and as I've said, there is no clinical consensus around the use of MRI across the UK. To address the issue of variation uh, across the UK, Dr Couchy has made great efforts to convene a UK-wide group to update the guidelines and to develop a consistent approach. When the Chief Medical Officer wrote to the committee on the 17th of May 2017, there was intent to convene a UK-wide consensus group. However, since then, the other centres outside of NHS Scotland have not been willing to engage in this process. Subsequent correspondence to the committee from officials mentions a Scottish guidelines group. This has been put together by Dr Couchy, who is actively pursuing the, absent, the development of Scottish guidelines in the absence of that UK-wide consensus. Dr Couchy has convened a group of clinic, clinical imaging and patient representatives and I understand that they are looking to report by June this year. This is important work and I am very grateful to Dr Couchy uh, for pursuing this uh, and look forward to receiving the group's report in the summer. I hope the information provided today will clarify to the committee uh, that people in Scotland with ocular melanoma are indeed recognised by the Scottish Government and NHS Scotland, which is why we've commissioned the National Specialist Service at Gartnaval. Anyone with this disease in Scotland can have an MRI scan if it is considered clinically appropriate and that work is underway, thanks to Dr Couchy, to try and ensure a degree of uh, clinical consistency uh, in the approach uh, and I'm grateful again for the opportunity to make that brief statement and happy to answer any further questions the committee may have. Okay, thank you uh, very very much. For that. I, I guess the centre of this is that, pe that the petitioners don't feel that they have access to MRI scans so that's something we want to explore. That's not their experience that you know the, the caveat if it's deemed to be clinically appropriate, that's going to be um, the challenge, I think, for all of us. But you did mention, um, and indeed uh, in the written submission in September 2018, the petitioner in Ian Galloway referred to Scottish Guidelines Group. And I wonder if you can give us an update on the group. You're saying they're going to report by June. June. Um, can you indicate its membership and the patient representatives? Will this be a patient with experience of what the petitioner refers to as, quote, the rarity complex issues and scanning modalities for ocular melanoma? I think it would be fair to say that the petitioners feel the condition itself is so rare, there's a lack of understanding, and that their direct experience of it would be relevant in this regard. 
So my, my understanding, I'm happy to um, provide uh, the committee with uh, uh, the names, if you like, uh, of who is on the group con uh, convened by uh, Dr. Uh, Couchy, but uh, I understand it has uh, the relevant clinical specialisms, uh, imaging expertise, and uh, a patient with experience of the disease. Okay, thank you very much for that. Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks. Um, following on from uh, the, the convener's question, um, you, you'll be aware, Cabinet Secretary, that the petitioner and Mr Galloway have, have also uh, previously highlighted concerns about the experience of ultrasonographers, uh, particularly in terms of interpretation and identifying metatastic uh, spread to the liver from uveal melanoma. Um, so uh, I'd be interested to hear how you would respond to those concerns. I think if we, um, if we look at the condition, and, and the convener has already mentioned about the, the rarity, Mr MacDonald, so it, we know that there are around five cases per million of the population of this ocular melanoma. So that would be in Scotland around 25 people per year. If we were to look at, at one of the most common cancers, for example, breast cancer, one in 12 women will develop breast cancer over their lifetime, that is 80,000 people per million. So we're looking at a, at, a, at a disease that really is rare. So that most doctors of any specialty, most general practitioners, will never ever see a case in their um, experience. And most of the staff dealing with people with ocular melanoma, other than at the specialist centre, will never see a case in their lifetime. So we're, we're, we, we understand that um, people who have this disease and have obviously a great understanding of it themselves will find that others do not have that understanding and don't have the detailed knowledge. The um, recommendations through various guidelines, it's clear when I look across the guidelines that there is not clinical consensus. Now, in, in part, that will be because of the small numbers of patients. So even across the UK, there are small numbers. What it would appear also to be uh, is that the research has not confirmed what the best modality of follow-up is and whether, in fact, one type of imaging is of greater value in ensuring that we detect metastatic disease early and, crucially, whether that makes any difference to survival. So we know that 90% of people with metastatic disease, that will be in the liver, so that it would therefore be the right thing to do to image the liver. The imaging of using ultrasound would, in routine practice, be your first port of call. Ultrasound is completely safe. It is non-ionising radiation, so it carries no further risks to the patient. If you're looking at a frequency of every six months, that over a person's lifetime is a, is a very large number of scans. So there is not clinical consensus as to whether, in fact, ultrasound alone should be the modality or whether ultrasound, as a, a, as a, a very safe procedure, followed by MRI is the right thing to do, where MRI in itself, with actually quite a significant dose of ionising radiation carries with it risks in particular if you're doing multiple scans over a patient's lifetime. Okay, thanks for that explanation. Okay, uh, Brian Whittle. Yeah, I think following on from that, is that um, in his most recent submission, Mr Galloway states that ultrasound scans uh, are, are um, not recorded, therefore the results of those scans, the interpretation is, o is, is open to interpretation at the time, um, where MRI scans have, are, are much clearer and, and also uh, available for others to uh, uh, almost have a second opinion. I wonder, do you have a, do you have a, a concern or an opinion around, uh, around Mr Galloway's concerns there? Uh, it, it, it's, um, I, I suppose I, I'm considering Mr Whittle the, the use of ultrasound in, in general terms. Mm. So. The, the routine of an ultrasound scan is that, uh, that the, um, there are still images taken during that so that um, those would be recorded and, and kept in any, as part of a clinical record. So there are pictures. The um, pictures would tend to be um, obviously if there was an abnormality found, but also if you're looking in particular areas, 
there, there would be metastatic disease can be seen in, in some areas of the liver earlier than others. That's to do with the, the way it spreads. There would be pictures then of, of clear areas of the, of the liver to, to um, record in the patient's uh, record. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm unclear as to so, 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 that there would, there's a report written but that if there was to need to be any second opinion, that there are always still images taken of ultrasounds which form part of the patient record. I, I, I don't think, because it's not a dynamic scan, that there would be video taken. In, in my specialty obstetrics, we, of course, can take a, a video um, of, of the ultrasound to be, to be saved and looked at again. But it, it's not the case that there are no records after an ultrasound is done or... or somebody can't come back and have a, have a look at, at images. If I, if I, could, yeah. I think, the, the, just from my, my clarity here, obviously, um, it's, it's not something I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm a particular expert in. So, but but Mr. Mr Galloway, I think, is trying to say that, that um, if they are being uh, scanned every six months, from your perspective, uh, you think that an ultrasound still stills comparative. If you were to compare one, one, uh, one six-month scan to the next, would be adequate enough to perhaps highlight any abnormality and, and that it, you, in your, con, your consideration that an MRI scan would not necessarily add uh, any complexity to that? So I, I'm, um, this, this isn't my expert area, so I'm, I'm reading and taking advice from experts, Mr Whittle. Mm. What I understand is that in the cases where there are, uh, ultrasound is performed, that the, the view is that that would pick up metastatic disease. The, the clinical consensus here is, is that if there are abnormalities or in groups of patients who are seen at high risk, whether that move is direct to MRI scanning in every case, that, that, that there is not agreement across the country about that. So we have a case where we know that everyone in Scotland will have access directly to those ultrasound scans, those people at high risk then, and, and there are various clinical criteria which put somebody into a high risk category, those criteria are, are, are age and, and certain appearances of the, of the um, melanoma. But they will have a, an ultrasound scan progressing to an MRI or an MRI scan directly. And, and at the moment we, we, we do not have the evidence as to whether one approach is clinically going to change the outcome for people over a different approach. But what we do know is that the significant dose of ionising radiation, which would be given in the course of regular six monthly MRIs, has the potential to cause harm. And, and that harm, just to be clear, would be the, the incidence of some of the blood cancers being significantly increased over a patient's lifetime. This is not an insignificant risk that, that, that a large dose which, which, of ionising radiation at very regular intervals carries that risk with it. Thank you. You, you would have thought then that there would be a clinical consensus not to do it then. Can I just say that we got a submission... Well, we, got a, we got a submission from uh, Neil Pearson, profession, Professor Onsmeyer, who is from the University of Southampton and is a cancer specialist, and they said, quote, we tend to do ultrasound first because it's cheap, not because it's better. And they also say that MRI is not harmful to patients. So that seems to me to be in direct contradiction to your justification for not recognising in something which is very rare, um, the request from petitioners that we, we have MRI rather than ultrasound. So if, if, if I... Uh can say, convener, I, I, think, I think it is an unfair characterisation of what we are saying to say that we don't recognise. We are working on the basis that there is no clinical consensus here. With respect, um, and that with is respect, not, what Catherine if, if Calderwood I could, said was that they don't, you recommend not using MRI because increased risk. The evidence we've got is that it's not about risk, it's about cost. N no. Um, what Dr Calderwood said, and I'm sure she's very able to speak for herself, but what she said was that there, there are risks associated um, with uh, frequent MRI scans in terms of uh, the, the uh, increased incidence 
uh, of blood cancers. Now that, so there are, there are different clinical views here as to whether or not that, that risk is balanced by uh, reducing risk in terms of uh, identifying uh, metas metastatic, metastatic. metastatic uh, spread into uh, the liver with the MRI. So there is, a, there is a balance of risk here. And I think we all understand, I hope, that in terms of uh, almost every area of health and medicine, it is a constant balance of risks mm -hmm. that we ask our clinicians to take. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that we work from how they uh, balance those risks. And that is precisely what Dr. Couchy is trying uh, to resolve, is to find that clinical consensus so there is greater consistency. But I would refute absolutely that what lies behind this is any consideration of cost. Okay. Now that is, of course, those who provided evidence to you, uh, they are entitled to their view, but it is a view that I disagree with. It is not about cost. It is about being um, led as the Cabinet Secretary, as I should be, by clinical opinion and clinical decision-making. And the current difficulty is around that absence of clinical consensus, and I'm very grateful indeed to Dr Couchy in trying to help us of resolve course, that. But you would accept that part of the problem is there are so few, few people who have this condition that you, you know, while you're doing research and trying to establish the balance of probabilities and the balance of risk, there's a very small group of people, there is not a body of, of evidence. And if you wait for the body of evidence, perhaps these people have been denied the treatment that they need. And, you know, you talk about the balance of risks. Professor Owen Meyer is explicit in saying that MRI is not harmful to patients. And in the context of the risk that they may be facing, if not being given an MRI scan, would you not accept the general view that you've expressed about MRI being, um, bringing its own risk, is, is something that should be recognised against the risk of you know, the experience of, of, of these patients. So you have exactly encapsulated what those clinicians uh, are trying to resolve, led by Dr Couchy, and I, I don't think it is accurate to say that we are waiting for a body of research. We have uh, a group actively engaged in the absence of being able to uh, secure UK-wide participation in trying to resolve this at a Scottish level and reach a level of clinical consensus, which then addresses many of the issues that the petitioner and members of the committee are raising. So it's not about long-term research, it's about trying actively to work, and they will report shortly in June to see if it is possible to have reached a, a greater degree of clinical consensus to guide this work. Um, but the, um, the, whilst there, there is, as, as you have said, uh, a clinician who believes that MRI scans do not carry risk, there are clinicians who would come forward and say, yes, they do. That is exactly at the heart it's of the just, matter and the balance, balance of risk balance that they have risk. to... Absolutely. It's a it balance is. of risk that the patients themselves are saying they're being denied, and if they lived in other parts of the country, they would not be denied. I'm sure you can appreciate from their point of view that this is not you know, a theoretical argument about a balance of risks. It's about their sense that they're not having access to treatment on an, the logic of an argument being propounded by um, the, um, Catherine Calderwood that is not agreed by everybody within the medical profession. They don't accept this question. Presumably, they don't accept it, or they wouldn't be able to ac access this, this routinely with that condition. They're routinely given an MRI scan in other parts of the United Kingdom. So, so as I understand it from what Dr Calder was had said and what I understand from what I have read, um, it is possible that there are uh, areas in Scotland where people will move to the MRI scan uh, and not ultrasound in those circumstances um, because there is a difference of view between clinicians about what is the most appropriate okay. next step. And I am not dealing with this, absolutely not, as some theoretical debate. I am very conscious uh, of the impact on individual patients. But it is not for me, as a Cabinet Secretary, to overrule 
uh, clinical experts in this area, but rather to be grateful to Dr. Couchy for the work that he is doing and look forward to his report and how he recommends he and his fellow clinicians should proceed. I appreciate that absolutely, that nobody is suggesting that you overrule clinical evidence. The problem is, because, and as they, they, they repeat, the petitions repeat the sense that because their condition is so rare, then it's not that it's been overlooked, but it's not properly understood and there's not a body of evidence. And they therefore feel that they're further punished in the sense of the way in which the condition affects them because there's not enough um, evidence of it. However, can I ask Maurice Corey? Um, panel, um, and to Cabinet Secretary, there are also concerns that there's a large proportion of patients in Scotland whose risk state, uh, status is unknown. And Mr Gallo in his report suggests that this is a consequence of many issues, including some missing biopsies and metastatic spread of the disease being picked up too late. How would you answer the point made by the petitioner, Mr Galloway, that ocular melanoma patients should be treated as at high risk? The Calderwood, I think, will? Probably, yes. I, I think... Um, Mr. Corrie, the, the petitioner has, been, has to be um, congratulated for bringing this very rare condition to a, a, a committee like this. And in, in doing that, to highlighting what, as I have said uh, to, in answer to Mr. McDonald's question, is, is a condition that in fact m most healthcare practitioners will not in fact even have heard of, let alone come across in, the, in a lifetime of practice because it is so rare. I think that the highlighting of, um, of the condition has led the, the two experts in Gart Naval Hospital to go back to look to see, uh, to convener's point, about what evidence we can actually get from the, the small numbers we have in Scotland. So I understand that there is, there is an audit being performed of the cases in Scotland that we have, so that those are cases from the past and, and looking forward. What those um, audit is aiming to do is to, is to tie up exactly where you are highlighting uh, via the petitioner that there are gaps in our data, so that, that, that um, each of the guidelines that we do have um, where there is consensus would state that, that biopsies would need to be done, that certain tests, certain amount of follow-up with, with periods of, of time, uh, and that the um, specialist centre is coordinating all of that. So what, what we will have with that audit, which I, I don't know the publication date, is um, firstly more knowledge of, this, of the disease as it is across Scotland with the, the people uh, that we have audited, but also where the gaps are. And, um, as happens with many of these rare conditions, people obviously themselves want to be treated closer to home for some, perhaps, of the treatments. For example, having an ultrasound, if you're living far away from Gart Naval, you have your ultrasound in your local hospital. But, but the important part that the audit will pick up is, are those people then having the treatments that they, they should have as if it was in the specialist centre? So are we giving the right treatment at specialist level, whether that's being delivered locally or being delivered in Gart Naval? Because we would not want a situation where patients who were, were, were living locally to Gart Naval or travelled there were able to travel, were getting a specialised service and others were having a service uh, locally that, that didn't tie up, didn't coordinate. So I think that that audit will, will I hope, highlight any gaps that there are with a view to improvements then in some of the uh, data issues that you have via the petitioner highlighted. Uh, if I may, Gavina, uh, uh, therefore, he will, they, out of this report, which hopefully will be published in June, it will also look at the determining of risk, correct? Yes. Yes. Um, um, if I can just add to that, uh, uh, the updated guidelines, which comes from uh, the work uh, that those clinicians, imaging experts and uh, involving the patient are doing will consider new evidence on genetic risk, uh, which will inform the definition of high risk. Right, OK. Can I just have one final bit here? Will it draw on the evidence in England? Because I actually have my very close friend's son has, has, has this problem and he has been caught, out, caught fortunately, positively, by having an MRI scan and, and has... And the continual six-month situation it doesn't seem to anybody. He's a runner. He's, a, he's doing a leading normal life, uh, but he had to come down and medically discharge from the army from the special forces. And so great, tragic situation. But the system in Hereford picked it up. The system in, in London picked it up, um, and so far he's clear. 
Will this, your, the author of this uh, report, audit, draw on the English results as well? So I, I understand they're reviewing all the evidence that is available, and the, the, the plan is that they will, on, using that evidence, using what we have in Scotland, yeah. obviously small numbers, pull together a consensus Good. then with, 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 yeah. with much more um, uh, standardised guidance mm. for use across Scotland, yes. Yeah, because I do realise in England there are, there, are, there are patches where it's better yes. than others. Uh, for example, Liverpool and Southampton are extremely good, uh, and I believe Sheffield is coming up behind that. So therefore, I think it's important that we look wider than the borders of Scotland. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. David Thomas. Thank you, Convener. A petitioner has constantly made a point that ocular melanoma patients are only referred to ocular oncologists but that it should be seen by a medical oncologist with experience in liver disease. What's your opinion on that? So my understanding is that um, in terms of the treatment of their ocular melanoma, then they are seen uh, by that uh, specialist, uh, but where uh, it, the cancer is detected as having spread to another organ, then it will be the oncology specialist in that organ who then picks up on that treatment. Um, can I ask, the petitioner and Mr Galloway present further arguments about the benefits of MRI as opposed to use of ultrasound, and these include access to MRI can often be arranged in some places in England by identifying and explaining risks, but this option appears to have been closed down to patients in Scotland. The option of joining clinical trials, which offer new and promising therapies, is denied to patients who don't have an MRI. And are there any particular barriers or challenges that the committee has not yet been informed of which prevent ocular melanoma patients from accessing MRI scans, apart from the points you made earlier about risk, which are obviously a matter of dispute. My, my understanding in, in terms of that latter part is that there are no other um, uh, factors uh, in the way. Uh, it is around this um, uh, absence uh, of uh, a, a consensus around the, the balance of those risks, uh, which, as I've said uh, earlier, Dr Couchy is trying to help move us forward by looking widely at all the evidence that is available uh, involving uh, the, that uh, imaging expertise, the patient's experience and so on. Um, so I, I, I do not uh, know of any additional barriers to this. Mm. But if you don't get an MRI scan, you can't get the clinical trials, which may help your condition. So that's clearly, you can see from the patient's point of view, why there's an incentive to have an MRI scan rather than ultrasound. Yes, I understand what the, what the petitioner is saying. That doesn't, it doesn't change your view on what should happen then? Well, well it, in truth, convener, as an unmedically qualified uh, Cabinet Secretary, it should not change my view. What should change my view is the work that is coming from those clinicians, imaging experts with that patient experience, which I expect to receive in June. And I would think that um, both the petitioner uh, and others would be reassured that it is not an unqualified politician who's uh, changing their view and uh, reorientating how clinical uh, care is delivered, but clinicians themselves. But, but what's clear to the, the petitioner is that there are clinicians who believe that the approach has been taken currently for them is not the right approach. So it's not that you haven't got clinical evidence, it's about which clinical evidence or the balance of clinical evidence that you respond to. But can I ask... Um, no, also sorry, convener, I, I, I do have to say I do not believe um, that that is the case. Um, I, I am not responding to one uh, set of clinical views over another, I am looking for those clinicians to find a way of reaching a degree of consensus which allows us to move forward mm -hmm. that is based on all available evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is exactly uh, you would what I am concede doing. That the, the committee has been given evidence by some clinicians that the approach in Scotland is disadvantaging patients because they're not routinely get an MRI scans and indeed to go back to the question from David Torrance that because they go to a, an ocular oncologist rather than going to somebody who's um, got broader um, issues around liver they may, there may be a delay that's causing problems but can I ask specifically around 
Um, I mean, I appreciate the amount of time that you've, you've given to this petition. Over the course of the consideration of this petition, there, there does appear to be some difference of opinion over the merit of peer-reviewed evidence. And the Scottish Government has indicated that the Scottish Guidelines Group will review articles. And I wonder if this has been done. Um, and are you aware of any um, recent developments in that regard? OK, so on that latter part, uh, Dr Calderwood um, will give an uh, initial response. I may add to it, but can I just, uh, for the record, uh, say that I uh, absolutely appreciate that the committee has heard from clinicians uh, who believe that uh, MRI scans should be uh, the first uh, port of call here, and, but I am saying that there, there would be other clinicians who would come forward, equally expert in this field, who would come forward to this committee and present the opposite view. And here we get to the crux of the matter and so what you, we so are you, trying so to resolve. So I will ask Dr that, Calderwood to respond to your question. You think clinicians who believe people ought not to get MRI scans? Is that so, what you're saying? Sorry? You're saying, you know, you're saying that people would give an absolute opposite view. What clinicians believe that there ought not to be an MRI scan for people no, who have this no, condition? No, 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 no. It is, it is whether or not, uh, in terms of the balance of risk, there are clinicians uh, who believe that uh, the, the risk of uh, frequent MRI scans is outweighed uh, by the benefit of having those and others who take a different view from that. But there are not explicitly clinicians who have said, in this very rare condition, that they believe there is too much risk to give them an MRI scan. That's not the opposite of what um, Professor Omsheyer said. No, I think what I was trying to say to you is that, you know, depending on the clinicians that come before the committee to give evidence, you will get different views. I, I don't think that yes, is disputed. But, but with respect, Cabinet Secretary said the opposite view, and I'm saying we have not had evidence that there's an opposite view okay. to the fact that these, these patients would benefit from an MRI scan for their condition. What you've seen, there are, there are people who are cautious about the general implications of MRI, but it's not addressing the specific issue because this is such a rare condition. We don't have clinicians saying the opposite of what Professor... Or they may be um, reluctant to take a complete view, but they say their general view is there may be a risk attached to MRI. They're not explicitly saying for this condition there is too much risk in taking an MRI scan. No, an MRI scan. So my apologies if, if I have used the wrong words, but there are, uh, there is a view amongst clinicians that the frequency of the MRI scans that would be required poses the risk yes. precisely as Dr Calderwood but, outlined. It, with some conditions, there will always be risk as a balanced risk, you've said that. But to be, to be clear, this committee has not received evidence from clinicians who said that for this condition, there is too much risk attached to uh, giving a routine MRI scan. To, if, to be kind about it, the jury is out on the question and you're saying that you hope to have an answer to that question by June. What I'm hoping for uh, by June is the report from Dr Couchy's uh, group uh, as far as they can make progress in that matter. Uh, now, on, on the other part of your question, I think Dr Calderwood wanted to provide some information. I, I think, Convener, you were asking about this Scottish Guideline group looking at peer-reviewed evidence. I can get you a note on that to confirm whether that has been done. OK, and... Um, I don't know if other members of the committee have final questions, but I would want to ask finally, once Dr Couchy reports, what's the expectation of what happens thereafter? Will that require further time or delay while standardised guidelines are developed? Um, I think we would obviously think maybe want to write to Dr Couchy to, to perhaps give evidence because we recognise, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, that there's clearly work getting done in this. We're not suggesting that work's not been done in it, but I, I wonder... So, when Dr Couchy reports, what's the next stage? So, Dr Couchy's, uh, the work that he is leading is to develop Scottish guidelines mm -hmm. uh, on liver surveillance. Uh, so, uh, the report that he will bring forward will, uh, I anticipate, include those uh, revised and agreed or introduced and agreed Scottish guidelines on liver surveillance that will, as I said earlier, consider new evidence on genetic risk to inform the definition of high risk and advise best approaches for long-term follow-up, including continue to offer 
uh, local services along the lines that uh, Dr Calderwood uh, spoke about earlier to ensure uh, a greater consistency uh, of approach and access uh, to services. Uh, you may want to add. I, I think, um, convener, one of the advantages here is that the, the, the two doctors are the specialists for Scotland. So the, uh, the two doctors are seeing every patient with the diagnosis and also seeing them for regular follow-up. So that um, in, in contrast to some of our um, more common cancers where there are lots and lots and lots of clinicians to be communicated with, we would have guidance produced by this group where there are only, uh, only two specialists seeing all patients and making sure that their appropriate follow-up is done, whether that be locally, but they will also be following them up in person in Gart Naval on a regular basis. So that the, 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 the implementation or, or any thought about delay in this is, is, is removed because those two individuals are, are involved with every single patient. So the report, the report comes in June and the, impl in the guidelines are implemented from June? Yes, I, I, if that's how they have written them as guidelines to be implemented. Well, they're, they're writing them for themselves, right, not so for other people, in, in that, that they'll guide the, the, the scanning, etc., that, that we're talking about this, this debate, but the, the, the people who are then pulling together the evidence are the people who are implementing it. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Morris, briefly. Can, can I address this at Dr. Calderwood? Dr. Calderwood, um, have you seen the terms of reference for, for what Dr. Gouch is proceeding with at the moment? I, I've seen, I haven't seen them as written as terms of reference. So you haven't reference. seen the terms of reference of what this report's going to hopefully produce? I, I have seen a summary of, yeah. of yes, as Cabinet Secretary has, has, has uh, and read. So therefore, the terms of reference, I mean, that's black and white. I, I suppose, I haven't seen them, I suppose, written as formal terms of reference, but I have seen, yes, and you uh, sign them off as being uh, appropriate? I don't sign off. Right, I, okay. That wouldn't be appropriate. I'm not Does an it include in anything in there? Coming back to the Chair's um, comment about MRI scans and the risk, is there a section in it that's going to address the scientific evidence to the risk element of multiple scan, uh, multiple MRIs? Is there anything in there specifically? Uh, so I, on, my understanding is that the evidence is being pulled together to give guidance on what the routine management of imaging for follow-up for these patients should be. And that's clearly in the terms of reference saying yes. it's scientific evidence. So they, well, they, they will need to gather what evidence there is in order to make yeah. some, um, some standardised guidance, as, right. as we would in any, um, in any group that is working towards this. So you can't say here today this. that that's actually clear in the terms of reference? Well, Sorry, I, I, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm now to, we're, I'm, we're talking at, at about two different things. So what I am understanding is that they will produce guidance on the imaging that will be recommended for follow-up of these patients. Mm -hmm. it, and the piece below that is that I, I, I don't know but could ask to see this terms of reference as to exactly what they have committed to. In some of these rare conditions, the, the scientific evidence is... is of such small volume mm. that there might have to be some other um, ways of coming to a consensus. Now, whether that be because there would be some a, a, a shared decision-making conversation with the patient, or whether that would be a consensus amongst experts rather than purely on scientific evidence, mm. if that doesn't exist in volume. But I'm now talking about detail that, that I have not discussed right. with the chair of that group. I, I can get you the terms of reference if that would be helpful. I think it would be Good, because I think this is such a question, as the Chair says, about the scientific evidence. I mean, we've got to be clear where we are on MRIs. Yes. We've got to be clear on the... I mean, I visited a nuclear power station recently, and, you know, and very clear guidelines on yes. that. But these are done by scientists. They're not done... You know, I mean, the users of science are the clinicians, OK? Are you with me? So we need those scientists to actually... Scientists actually to give clear evidence on that. And I'm very surprised yes. that you haven't got a clear view of the terms of reference on that specific area. So I, I wouldn't routinely see that sort of detail, Mr. Corrie. What I would say to you, though, is that given that we are in the situation we're in, mm. the scientific evidence must not come down very clearly on one side or another, or we wouldn't be here. No, granted. There, well, that's a kind of that's a circular argument, yeah. isn't it? That, that, that probably the petitioner finds it difficult to to break into. Can I maybe just finish? Sorry. Unless yeah, there, are, yeah. uh, there are other questions, I just want to finish off with a, 
a bit from uh, Ian Galloway's submission, which I think you may not be able to respond to, but he makes this point. I think it's quite a powerful one that maybe you would want to reflect on. He says that around 50% of all ocular melanoma patients have the disease return, and in those, 90% or so are in the liver. This same huge figure, which is considerably higher than many other cancers, so it's a figure of 50%, will be the proportion of those whose risk is indeterminate, whose cancer will return. That's a significant proportion of our patients at risk who aren't being, in his view, prop appropriately scanned. We should also note that pharmaceutical companies and those sponsoring clinical trials will, trials will simply not permit ultrasound scans as sufficient evidence of disease spread, which is why they demand MRI. And we consequently deny, in his view, this opportunity to our, quote, indeterminate risk cohort to do you understand why this has become such a significant issue for the petitioner and those supporting her yes I do, yes, I do understand that and I think that uh, our specialists in Scotland uh, at Garton Abel, uh, also understand that too which is why they are uh, leading have initiated and are leading the work here to try and address some of those the issues that the petitioner is raising Okay, I think with that, um, we have probably reached the end of our consideration of this petition. And again, I think it's been very useful to try and tease out what the issues are, particularly that have driven the petitioner to bring the petition to us and um, the evidence given by um, Mr Galloway. I wonder in terms of action, I think we're saying we would want to um, perhaps hear from Dr Couch. I think it would be very useful to hear about the work and, and in terms of, this, quite rightly, Cabinet Secretary makes the point, these are clin clinicians working in the field who are, have a great deal more expertise than us. I think we'd also want to hear from the petitioner and particularly Mr Galloway, but others who have an interest in responding to the evidence that they've heard. Is there anything else, Brian? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's important here to, that we, we are, we're able to at least link up the concerns brought by the petition to the, the, the evidence gathering that uh, currently the, the, the clinical uh, 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 experts are doing, so that they, at least they're aware of the, the concerns that uh, the people the petition brings. I think that would be really useful. Okay. Morris? The scientific side of the risk for MRI as well. Okay. So we just can, clinicians, we can, yeah. We can take that forward as well. Okay. Um, in that case, can I would want to thank... Um, Cabinet Secretary um, English to this petition and in order to be charitable to us all, I'm suggesting we take a, a five minute break and we'll suspend.
If I can call the meeting back to order, and can we now move to the final petition for consideration this morning, which is Petition 1690, lodged by Emma Shorter on behalf of ME Action in Scotland on review of treatment of people with ME in Scotland. And for this um, petition, can I welcome back Emma Harper, MSP, and also Mark Ruskell, MSP. In previous written and oral evidence, we have heard concerns about the consistency of treatment for ME sufferers across different health boards, the training and educational materials, the efficacy of cognitive behavioural therapy and graded exercise therapy, and the level of investment in biomedical research recently announced by the Scottish Government. Recent written submissions have been included in their meeting papers, and a further submission received from ME Action Scotland has been provided for members for this morning's meeting. The Cabinet Secretary is accompanied by the Chief Medical Officer and Elizabeth Sadler. Um, and can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a, a brief opening statement before we move to questions? Thank you very much, uh, Convener. And uh, again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to your consideration of this petition about ME. Uh, our written submission of the 12th of July last year sets out in comprehensive terms, I think, our response to each of the points raised by the petitioner, and I am very happy to answer any questions you may have on this. But I would like to start by making uh, what is a fairly fundamental, but I think important point to people living with ME, and that is, I believe you. Uh, I believe that you. this disease is a life-limiting disease in terms of the quality of your life. I hear uh, what you are saying to us and that your experience does matter to me as a Cabinet Secretary. I, I was pleased uh, to meet with the petitioner, Emma Shorter, and her mother, uh, Janet Sylvester, yesterday to hear from them firsthand the impact that Emmy has on uh, Emma's life, but also uh, on the life of uh, her mother as a carer. Whilst we had limited time in that uh, meeting, it was very helpful to me, uh, and I can assure the committee that I do want to make progress and make life better for people like Emma who live with this condition. However, in order to make progress, we have to recognise the position we are starting from. And that is one where there is clearly a lack of evidence, both around what causes ME and from that how to treat ME. We need more research into this condition. The only way to build an evidence base which can inform treatment options and the development of service is by enhancing the research base. Now, government doesn't initiate research, but we can and we will work with the ME community to try to enhance the research base that currently exists. Over the past 18 months, We've also been developing Scotland's first national action plan on neurological conditions in co-production with partners and stakeholders, including people living with neurological conditions, their carers and families. This is a wide-ranging five-year plan that has been welcomed by the neurological community in Scotland. I'm aware that we've had engagement with the ME community as part of the development of the draft plan, and that feedback was considered by our National Advisory Committee during the plan's development. As this is a broad plan which aims to make improvements for everyone living with a neurological condition, it does not include condition-specific measures. However, we will continue to take any feedback received through the consultation process on board. The consultation is open until the 8th of February, and I would encourage people to continue to participate in shaping the final plan. Finally, we will continue to work closely with others, including the third sector, to support the work they do for, living, uh, for people living with ME. In recent years, we've invested just under half a million pounds in funding towards that purpose, and I now look forward uh, to taking uh, questions from the committee around the three main areas uh, of the petition. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and I'm sure the petition has very much appreciated the opportunity to speak to you directly, and I'm sure um, across the committee we've had representations from people um, who uh, have AME, and certainly my sense is that that very strong feeling of not being believed, and as a consequence being given treatments that actually make things worse, um, compounds the, the ready challenge, the circumstances in which they find themselves. And, and you, you, you spoke about the National Action Plan um, 
recent, recently published by the Nat National Advisory Committee on Neurological Conditions. But, you know, as the petitioners note, there is no data on the current prevalence of ME in Scotland. So do you believe that the National Action Plan can be relevant to people with ME, given that there is such a lack of data and a lack of understanding of the illness amongst neurologists? Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think the national, the current draft uh, action plan uh, will be uh, enhanced uh, by the contribution that uh, ME action and, and individuals living with ME uh, could make uh, to that, con uh, that consultation to help uh, us understand better uh, what is needed in terms of that uh, action plan uh, from those individuals. I completely take their point about the absence of, of uh, data uh, and research on, on this matter. Uh, what the National Action Plan, though, is trying to do is not condition specific for any uh, in particular neurological condition. It is aiming to identify, uh, if you like, a common uh, set uh, of actions that, that should be taken that would assist individuals uh, living with a neurological condition, um, in, uh, regardless in a sense of what the specific condition is. Uh, but in developing that, we then, I would then expect, for example, those living with ME to say uh, th th that set of actions uh, are fine and they work for us, but you've missed these other things that are specific to us uh, that we need. Uh, and we would then uh, want to look at that and work with them to see what more then we would need to do. But I, I need, if you like, the, the absence of uh, research, as the petitioner recognises and I recognise, and perhaps we might want to go on and look at what more we might do there uh, as a government in that regard. Uh, and the absence of data uh, means that, that, quite rightly, we should be working from their lived experience of this. Uh, and so... That's why I need n not only that very brief meeting, uh, perhaps uh, further discussions, but I need to hear from them into that uh, draft action plan consultation. Okay, thank you very much for that. Maurice Corey. Ms Sadler wants to just add another yes, piece of information. Just add a couple of points. First of all, so um, the, the data on the numbers of people with neurological conditions that are included in the draft action plan was taken from um, ISD data, and we absolutely recognise that it is not complete and it doesn't include um, people um, with a, who have, have ME. There is a specific commitment in um, the plan which is about actually... Um, improving that range and depth of data about the numbers of people. From other sources, we estimate that there are around 20 to 21,000 people in Scotland with ME. So it is a prevalent um, disease across the country. Um, and the ME community have been very active in terms of engaging with the development of the plan. Um, for instance, um, we did some work around a lived experience survey with the Health and Social Care Alliance uh, to get the views of people um, as part of the development of the work. And 33% of the responses to that were from people with ME. So we are seeking to go out and, and, and get the people's views, and we are absolutely committed to improving the data on the numbers, which could then be followed up by research, potentially. Do you have... This is a condition I was aware of 30 years ago. I worked with... with I mean, there was a lot of scepticism and probably very unhelpful commentary around about it in the 80s, but I, mean, I worked with one specific colleague... Um, who had the condition, who absolutely, you know, it was absolutely evident to me that this was a, a significant problem. Do you have a view of why, 30 years on, they almost are still at the point of proving that they exist, that they don't appear in the data? So I'm, I'm going to ask Dr Calderwood uh, to uh, give an, some response to that point. Um, like you, convener, I first came across people with ME as a junior doctor in Glasgow, where I did a regular clinic at Ruck Hill Hospital uh, in Mary Hill. And it was very clear to me then that um, this was a, a condition that really was uh, very debilitating. It, it's a very complex condition. As you know, um, the WHO defines it as a neurological condition. But it's, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. The diagnosis of exclusion means that there are people are coming forward with a range of symptoms, and as you know, the range of symptoms is quite wide, and the range of of um, the effect on on a person's life is also very broad. So symptoms can can range from 
from nausea, from dizziness, extreme fatigue is, is always there, which is, 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 is not helped by any amount of sleep or rest, mm -hmm. muscle um, pain, the, the inability to um, be able to perhaps uh, have enough energy to get out of the house in, in extreme cases, and, and a wide range of, of symptoms and also effects in between that, from the most severe people who are, are, are bed-bound and have an extreme sensitivity to light and noise and really um, have a, a, an extremely poor quality of life, to other people who have um, a, ability to perhaps have some... Um, uh, a, a job that they manage their illness. So we, we have something, though, that is, in, in scientific terms, uh, uh, somewhat unusual in that we haven't got a test. We haven't got biological markers. We can't do a blood test or, a, or a, an imaging test that comes back where the, the report says this person has ME. And in, therein lies much of the issue. And, and that is why I think that the, 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 the many years since you and I first had uh, contact with people with this very real condition, this, this um, very debilitating condition, ha has not moved on. So that the second part then is that, that in not having a, um, a way, a means of diagnosing, except by exclusion, we also don't have a cure. So we, we, we haven't got a mechanism by which to... Um, create medication or, or find a, a, a treatment through some usual modality uh, in medicine to actually treat people because without knowing the cause we haven't got a way of researching how a cure would be best found and I think that it, when I look at the literature across the world that this is what is being struggled with very currently actually in Australia there's a committee um, with, with presenting evidence very, very um, uh, similar, grappling with very similar issues that our petitioner here has brought forward. But we know across uh, in the US and other countries that the, exactly this point that you've brought forward is, is very prevalent, that, that there, there, there doesn't seem to be um, a recognition. Uh, and we're talking about something that, that we've been aware of for many decades without appearing to have made much progress. And I would hope that that given what uh, our petitioner has brought forward, that we in Scotland may be able to, um, to start to, to move forward uh, rather than saying this, this, is, this is something that can't be done. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, I think that's very useful. Uh, Maurice Corry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, will you ensure that adequate resources are going to be made available to the information gathering group um, so that we get as much data as possible on the prevalence of ME in Scotland and also to ensure that no stone is unturned? Yes, we, we will. I mean, the, as Ms Adler said, uh, part of what is in the draft action plan is a commitment uh, to improve uh, data collection and the data uh, and the sources uh, of that. And so um, when that uh, draft action plan becomes a plan, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, the commitments in that uh, will be resourced. Right, OK. So, right, so that'll follow on from the, yes. when, when the draft plan's put forward and you'll then make that commitment to yes. make sure that it gives the end uh, results we're looking for. Yeah. Well, it, it, that it produces improved Evidence data. and data, yes. Sorry, yes. I mean, that's what yes. I mean. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Um, Angus <coughs> MacDonald. OK, thanks. <coughs> Convener, um, just continuing with the issue of resources and your, your plan to enhance the, the, the research base. Uh, and uh, for the record, can, can you advise us uh, Cabinet Secretary of the Scottish Government will provide funding uh, for a patient-led national ME strategy to address the issues that have been raised in the petition uh, and in the evidence that we've seen to date. So, um, I think there are a number of factors in that. So, um, as I understand uh, what the issues the petitioner is raising uh, and from the, the brief opportunity I had yesterday to have that personal conversation, that there are issues around, first of all, what, what can be done to enhance the research base here. Um, picking up on Dr. Calderwood's uh, point about um, this, this being a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, so you know, what can be done by way of research to try and move away from that uh, to see if there are uh, other ways of, of reaching that diagnosis. Uh, and then from that, uh, how um, uh, this may be treated. Uh, 
there's that element and we need to um, look and I'm very uh, committed uh, with the Dr Calderwood and through her, the Chief Scientist Office, as we heard earlier, uh, which is part of her uh, locus inside uh, Scottish Government, to look at how we might enhance the existing research base. I do think that that requires, uh, it, it's a, it's a, if you like, it, it has to include um, a reaching beyond Scotland uh, in terms of uh, as Dr Calderwood said, there are other countries grappling with similar issues, so we need to um, uh, connect with, with where they are and, and what they are uh, discovering, if you like, so that we can enhance what we have. Uh, I think we also need to look, though, uh, with uh, those who are living with ME about what they require in terms of care and support. So, you know, not waiting until we uh, have got a better research base and, and uh, greater clarity on what treatment options might be appropriate. But right now, people are living uh, with ME, so we, need, we do need to look at the work that needs to be done in order to increase awareness uh, and understanding uh, of this uh, condition, and therefore from that, what people need uh, in terms of care and support. Uh, and we are... Uh, we do want to work with uh, ME Action and, and uh, others uh, to try and uh, understand better what, what needs to be done and then put that in place. I'm not sure, uh, Mr McDonald, if that, if that completely uh, answers your question, but I guess what I'm saying is you know, I need to know uh, what it is that we need to do uh, and then we will bring the resources to bear in order to ensure that happens. Okay, so you, basically you're not ruling out funding for a, a, a patient-led national ME strategy? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. But, uh, and I think the, the, what I, I hope committee members know that, that I am uh, very committed to the importance of lived experience across a whole range of issues that as government we need to look at uh, in contributing to our thinking and our policy development and understanding. Uh, very committed to that indeed. It's not exclusive, uh, but it is a very important element. And I think in this area in particular, um, where we have it right at the moment, if you like, um, perhaps a, the, a significant body uh, of experience to work from is indeed patient-led experience. Thank you, Gabina. Um, one of the concerns the petitioner brought forward is that some health boards are continuing to offer that sort of a, a graded exercise therapy and, and cognitive behavioural therapy as a treatment for people with ME, uh, despite there being little evidence that CBT is an effective as a treatment. And as you said, Cabinet Secretary, there's this absence of data, so you're having to rely on uh, lived experience. Um, so I wonder, with, with that in mind, would you consider requesting that these treatments are withdrawn uh, from the published material uh, prior to any review of the NICE guidelines. So I'm going to ask Dr Calderwood to uh, pick up on that. Um, thank you, Mr Whittle. I think that from my own experience in, in the clinics looking after people with ME, it was clear that there, there's, there's a wide range of the way this illness affects people. And I think I've, uh, we've heard that from the petitioners and from, um, from, from what we can read. The, um, perhaps the issue with some of the treatments, given that I have said that we know that there isn't a cure, is that some of the treatments have been deemed to be the treatment and therefore suitable for all. And what clearly has happened is that in, in some cases the treatment has been continued with despite the fact that the person has, has not been finding it beneficial, or even worse, has actually found it detrimental to their illness. So you and I have talked previously about realistic medicine, mm -hmm. and two of my fundamental principles there are shared decision-making and a personalised approach to care. So in my view, the continuance of any kind of treatment where that person is telling the, the, the practitioner that it is not beneficial and in fact it is detrimental, why would we continue with that? Why would we push somebody into something that is clearly from their experience not right for them? What we do know though from um, some of the work that the pilot in Lothian did was that, that some of these therapies have been beneficial for some people and again that would be where I would bring that shared decision-making and personalised approach to care here. So what is right for somebody may not be right for somebody 
in a different situation. And what we must do is discuss this with people. What, what we would, would, would not be doing is continuing a treatment when, and I know that this has happened, and, and that is a matter of, of regret. Um, but, but for some people, with their, um, dis, their them sharing in that decision, some of these treatments may be helpful. And for that reason, I think we need to be very cautious about saying that we would withdraw any particular treatment. But on the other hand, of course, we must not continue with treatments where for an individual that is clearly not the right thing to do. Can, can I just add to that? We have, as, as I'm sure you know, uh, the Scottish Good Practice Statement on, on ME, um, and they recognise that uh, some treatments is, are controversial, and they are those guidelines are clear that nobody should be required to have any treatment that they don't want. Um, now, uh, I think uh, in, in a, a very brief uh, coverage of that, uh, yesterday, like Dr. Calderwood, I, I do recognise that that, that uh, has, not all, has not been the case in every circumstance. Uh, and I think it goes back to uh, an earlier point about awareness and education uh, amongst our uh, clinical community mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that they know uh, that there is a Scottish Good Practice Statement on ME and that what it says clearly, that here, as elsewhere, uh, treatment decisions should absolutely involve the patient and people should not feel compelled to take a, 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 to undergo a treatment which they do not want. Uh, I think that that is the route to pursue here rather than uh, given that for some there is some evidence that the, those uh, what are controversial treatments uh, are producing some benefit rather than withdrawing but actually asserting that people should be actively involved in decisions around the treatment that they engage in or not. So if I follow up on the, given the, the, the lack of data and lack of understanding generally uh, across, um, as we've taken evidence uh, from in this committee, that a lot across the medical profession, how then do you, are we able to cask, or how are you able to cascade that kind of approach uh, to ME, where we've heard a lot of evidence uh, where, where some medical practitioners still deny the actual existence of ME, which for an ME sufferer must be, you know, a, a, a terrible experience to have. How do we then, uh, how are we able to cascade that kind of approach uh, down through into our, our, our frontline services, which is always seems to me to be one of the, the key elements here? So. So I'd want to say two things, I think, in response to that. Dr Calderwood uh, may want to um, add to it. Um, so, so one of the things that I don't think is, is, uh, would be an especially helpful approach, because there is a, a lack of um, sufficient evidence and research, is, if you like, to get into an argument uh, with uh, clinicians between those who do recognise ME and those who don't. I think that is where looking at how we can enhance the research base uh, assists us uh, in resolving uh, that particular question because the absence of uh, sufficient research uh, can be used um, uh, as a reasonable ground uh, for individuals uh, to pursue different uh, uh, arguments whether they accept ME uh, exists or not, but I completely uh, understand the more than frustration uh, about how that must feel if you have this condition and uh, it is not um, accepted as a medical condition and is not recognised. In terms of how we um, enhance that research base, um, I have asked it chief medical officer um, to consult with the chief scientist about uh, what more Scottish government might do in order to uh, assist uh, our academic communities um, to uh, increase the level of research. We have provided uh, some initial funding uh, to support a PhD student to begin some of this work, but there may be more that we can do in that regard. In terms of how we make sure that um, uh, that uh, statement, uh, good practice statement, is more widely understood, then that is a piece of work that I think uh, 
we need to take away and look at through the various uh, networks and so on that we have, both uh, inside the clinical community, uh, through the chief uh, medical officer, but also uh, through health, the health board community uh, in terms of uh, my locus, if you like, how we um, increase uh, awareness and understanding and alongside that, uh, that statement of good practice uh, so that uh, we can reduce um, the incidence of individuals feeling that they are being compelled to take a treatment uh, which they do not want. I could just, I mean, given, given uh, when the convener opened this line of questioning, the, the length of time that uh, we've been aware of MU, surely we're in a situation now where we c nobody should deny the existence of the condition. Um, we surely can't, we can't accept medical practitioners taking the opposite view to that. We're sure that's something that has to be tackled. We could tackle that right now. I don't know if Dr Calderwood wants to pick that up. I, th I think that, um, again, uh, due to this petition, Mr Whittle, the, the, uh, and the, those very um, s the statistics which do show that such a large number of the medical profession do not accept as a, as a condition, I believe it was 50%, up to 50% of general practitioners. Um, we undertook to write to the um, chair of our um, academic medicine board for medical schools, Peter, Sir Peter Rubin, and he has distributed that letter to the deans of the medical schools in Scotland, so with, with some information about highlighting this condition and some of the, um, the detail that I gave uh, earlier to medical students so that that is, is uh, incorporated into their curriculum. Now, we, we can't dictate what medical schools put in their curriculum, but I think that, that um, while not a solution immediately, if we are actually teaching our medical students, therefore our future doctors, about this condition, uh, that will, will, will change attitudes. It, it's not something that is, is previously being focused on. But for absence of doubt, there is there's there's no way we can turn around and say ME doesn't exist as a condition. But in a situation where we are just now, there's no way that ME can be we can deny that it exists as a condition. And if that's the case, surely there must be a way to to cascade that down into the frontline staff that, that, that no longer will be acceptable to say or to deny the, the existence of ME. So to, to confirm, the, the WHO has a definition of ME <coughs> slash chronic fatigue syndrome, yes. So it's, it's in a, a World Health Organization definition of a disease. So, why, so, we, so I'm just sorry to push you on this. We, we, therefore, we can't accept any of our medical practitioners denying the existence of it and therefore denying access to treatment. So... So that World Health Organization definition, this government absolutely accepts. Uh, and so we would, we would be saying to practitioners, um, the World Health Organization accepts this condition exists. This government uh, accepts this condition exists. Uh, NHS Scotland uh, uh, accepts that this condition exists. And therefore, we expect uh, you in carrying out your clinical practice to operate from that basis. Um, now, th there is no reason uh, why we would not make that crystal clear, and I'm very happy to make that crystal clear. However, what, um, and frustrating as it, as it is, uh, what I think we all have to accept, that it is nonetheless right, uh, and we accept it across the whole spectrum uh, of uh, medical conditions, that uh, the clinician's decision in terms of uh, their uh, views and their decision-making uh, and how uh, they work with an individual patient uh, is not a decision that uh, can be countermanded, if you like, uh, by me. Uh, so I can't instruct them to do that. Uh, I can say what NHS Scotland's uh, position is, what the government's position is, and therefore what I expect. But I am not in every clinical situation and consultation um, what, I, what I can then do is make sure that uh, they, they are aware of and understand 
uh, what the statement of good practice says and our expectation that they will work to that statement of good practice and then look to see additionally how we may uh, provide support to individual patients um, in their right to uh, not undertake treatment that they do not wish to. So, so there's a number of ways you can go about it, yeah. but what I, what I can't do is issue an instruction to clinicians in that way. Sorry to push in this. I mean, I absolutely accept you would never countermand any um, sort of medical diagnosis or, uh, or treatment. I think the point I'm making is that we can't have medical practitioners who, before uh, treatment, deny the existence of ME. That, that, that's, that's when I'm getting to ensure that that is something that we can do something positively about. Uh, and I think, Mr Whittle, what, what would disturb me most would be that um, somebody with, who is presenting with symptoms, regardless of what that medical practitioner believed or otherwise, if they're presenting with symptoms, they are, of course, um, needing treatment and help with those symptoms. So I, I think we can, we can, we, what, what must, we would be able to say is that those list of symptoms that I have uh, discussed already are, are symptoms that need to, to then be treated. I think that where I would like to get to is that, is that some of the frustration that the petitioners and also medical practitioners have is that, some, that, that, that their range of treatment options are limited. They're, 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 they're not, uh, their knowledge about what the treatment options that might be best is limited. And actually, if they then wanted to access some treatments, those are, those are not, that they're available in some places and not others. So I would want to move from, um, from regardless of that practitioner's opinion, if let's put it that way, about a WHO-defined disease, that the people suffering from this illness need help. And that, that's where we need to get to, is that that help, appropriate help that's individualised to them um, as a patient in their own situation, that that help is, is made available to them. And it's very clear that at the moment in Scotland, that's not the case. Thanks. Can I just ask a very brief question before I take the next question? You said that people shouldn't be compelled to take treatment, which is entirely fair. Do you think there's an issue, however, about people being judged when they say, I don't want to do that? Um, I think we got evidence from Professor Edwards, and I don't want to put words in his mouth. My reading of what he said was, it was almost as if there was a false correlation. People benefited from this treatment, and the implication was, as ME patients, they benefited from this treatment. But in fact, ME patients are saying there's got nothing to do with their condition and being compelled or feeling obliged or under pressure to take um, CBT or GAT um, action is actually making things worse. Do you accept that there is an issue here about people being judged? You may say they're free to refuse, but that in itself then becomes an issue, well, they wouldn't engage and they're not in, and the kind of, are they being reluctant? Are they just being difficult? Whoever kind of feeds into that narrative? Yeah, I, I accept that uh, it, it is credible to me that that situation um, can arise, and, and uh, from what uh, I have been advised by those suffering from ME, has arisen. So that is that is credible, and I think it, it goes to a lack of awareness and understanding of the condition uh, and how the um, how the condition you mentioned it yourself, convener, um, you know, 30 years ago uh, was unfairly characterised. The individuals mm -hmm. uh, suffering from this condition were unfairly characterised. I think it is it is fair to say that some of that unfair character characterisation persists, um, and that goes to one of the areas that the petitioner is raising, uh, and that I am accepting that we need to uh, do uh, much more work on, and that is to. Uh, raise awareness and understanding in order to minimise those the numbers of people, uh, be they clinicians or otherwise, who who do not believe that there is such a condition, uh, and therefore act from that belief um, uh, in a way that is very unfair 
and debilitating for the individuals who suffer from the condition. And I think the other important point in that regard, though, is while we are looking to change uh, those attitudes and views, is Dr Calderwood's point that as a clinician, someone coming to you with symptoms, re regardless of your personal view about whether the condition of ME exists or not, your job is to treat and deal with those symptoms and treat that individual and provide them with um, whatever care and support uh, you can. Okay. Thank you. David Torrance. Some of the evidence presented to committee focuses on the investment recently announced by the Scottish Government. For example, the petitioner notes that an investment of £15,000 per year over the next three years equates to 70 pence per patient. How would you respond to this concern? concern? Now you consider that this investment is sufficient to build on research capacity. So this is um, the support that we've given to uh, uh, that PhD student uh, uh, in order to begin some of the work um, that looks at, at how we might enhance the research base. So it's the, I believe it was ME Action uh, who approached us for that support uh, and we've given it. Um, that, that doesn't preclude uh, what I, I touched on earlier, which is uh, my ask of the uh, Chief Medical Officer and uh, through her, the Chief Scientist, to look at how we might further support an enhancement of this research base. So... Um, this is not uh, the only thing uh, that I hope that we will be able to do in this regard. But we responded to a request from ME Action to support uh, that PH student, HD student to do that work, uh, along with, I think it's uh, Professor Ponting, um, and we've responded to that. But that's not the end of the story. Thank you. Um, Brian Whittle. You know, just uh, moving on from what we were discussing earlier on, and I think uh, we're agreed in, in, in here that there is a lack of evidence uh, around the understanding uh, of ME among healthcare professionals, also identified in the National Advisory Committee on Neurological Conditions Report on the Lived Experience Survey. How can we ensure that NHS Education for Scotland provides that effective education and training based on the most up-to-date biomedical research? Um, I think Ms Sadler wants to... Uh uh, tell us where we are with NES Scotland. Um, so, um, I think we say we've also, what we've also done in this area um, is around, we've given money to Action for ME um, um, to support um, the funding of um, information for health professionals um, around their, their website now hosts a series of materials on uh, good practice um, and they provide webinars for shared learning, local models of care and good practice and they've also worked with NHS Inform to put the information onto NHS Inform around ME. Um, in terms of, um, of NES, um, they are doing some um, work Sorry, I'm, um, the module. Yeah, they're doing a training module for um, GPs, which is around raising awareness and support for the GPs, and that will be coming in their next um, iteration of work later this um, in the next financial year. How, how do we how do we ensure you know a, a positive uptake on those kind of that kind of training sort of webinar type of training? A positive uptake on? The secretary, we were discussing just now whether that be in the modules, whether that be in the webinars. How do we ensure that there's a, there's a, a, a good uptake in that? So, so on the modules, uh, my understanding is that when uh, uh, NES uh, and uh, Education for Scotland, NHS Education for Scotland, uh, considered looking at this, they uh, undertook a bit of work um, through the, the, the GP uh, group that they work with uh, to see how it would be responded to, and they got a very positive response from GPs um, that they would like to have such a, a training module available to them. So, on the, so NES are now undertaking that work, and therefore we would, it, it, on the basis of the initial positive response that, yes, we would like that additional training, that we then expect it, the uptake of it um, to be uh, positive. But we would always look to see uh, how positive that uptake was and uh, what more we might do to encourage GPs to undertake that additional training. Thank you. Yeah, I'm conscious of time, because we really want to be finished and wrapping this up by 
25 we have to stop by 22. So I'm going to ask our two colleagues who are not committee members to make contributions now, and then if there's time left, there's a number of other questions that we want to raise, but I'm keen to allow you to participate. So, Mark, first, and then Emma. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, so there's been some comments made, Cabinet Secretary, about enhancing research, and I'm wondering to what extent the kind of provision of specialist support on the ground can actually help develop that, that research and help to fill the gaps in terms of you know, what is effective support and, and treatment for people with ME. Because there does seem to be a, an issue here in that, particularly in, in Fife, seems to be quite a popular support service that's been put in place. Uh, it's become very overstretched, but that's not the kind of support service that is being offered across uh, Scotland at the moment. Uh, and so I'm, I'm interested to know how, how, how the sort of rollout of particular approaches to supporting people with ME can be part of that growing knowledge and understanding about how to, how to effectively treat and support people with, with a condition and how we can enhance that as part of a, a package of research. So I'm going to ask Dr Calderwood to answer that um, before uh, she does convene. A, um, I appreciate your point about our timing. Um, I have a general questions at 22 uh, and I think I'm first up, so I'd appreciate that. Move on time. Finish by half past. There may be a couple of questions that we want to direct to you that we will just send to you. I think that would be fair. I think you, you <laughs> more than uh, earned your corn this morning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a pity you've got the first question up as well. Uh, no uh, rest. Thank you. I appreciate but, uh, that. No, no, I'll, I'll try and finish by half past. We thank want to you. respond to that. I'll take Emma and I think the committee will then come to conclusions rather than dealing with the last few questions we've got, but we will send them to you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Ruskell. I, I think again, on, 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 I would, I'd like to congratulate the petitioners for, for bringing this um, illness in what we've said is, is something that has been denied, that has been ignored, that has been something that there, ha there haven't been provision of treatment, nor indeed uh, to, to Mr. Torrance's question, uh, the, the provision of funding for research, as there has been in other um, neurological conditions. So, I think that when we when we we pull together what the petitioners, and I think some of them are here today, have, have bravely brought forward, is that, is that what we need now in Scotland is, is a coordinated approach to um, the uh, illness of, of ME. And what we are proposing is a, a working group which will look at the provision of services, so they would take the good practice that you are talking about in NHS Fife. We, we, we will obviously need to, to scope out what the, the ask is what they, um, we know up to 20,000, 21,000 people in Scotland. So each GP practice has around 20 patients. And, and actually look then at, at the Lothian pilot where there were some, um, some uh, effective interventions, effective treatments. So we, we would take where we have good practice in Scotland, Mr. Ruskell, and, and bring those people who've been involved in that into a, a working group uh, for this condition. I think we've got a whole series. I, I can see it scoping out already with, to Mr. Whittle's point about the education and awareness raising, um, to the, the um, availability then of, of treatment and then how to provide those treatments. At, at the moment, of course, we haven't got a cure, as I've said. We have some treatments that work and some that obviously clearly don't work for everyone. And, and with all of that going on in the background then, this, this enhanced research. I think we need to be aware that we, we in Scotland will probably need to join up on the research front, uh, probably globally, because as I said, the other countries are, are really in the same position as us struggling with, with many of the issues that the petitioners have brought forward. And what I wouldn't want is that we set off something that then is delayed because people are suffering at the moment. So I think what we can do even while we wait for the NICE mm -hmm. guidance, which is due to be published in 2020, is that we in Scotland can set up this um, working group to tackle issues that we can tackle while we await some of the evidence. And we, we can tackle that with some of the good practice that, that we already know works in places like NHS 5. Emma? Thank you. I'll be very, very short. I'm aware there's a Commons debate today led by SNP MP Carl Monaghan about uh, calling for more funding for biomedical research. So both Westminster and, uh, and Scottish Government are welcome. But for me, I'm just going to follow it and any questions I'll be happy to send on and uh, raise them later. So, Thank you very much for that. Can I uh, 
thank the Cabinet Secretary and our colleagues for attendance. We will now go on to consider the petition, but I think it will be helpful to you if you um, want to leave your permission to leave if you need such a thing. And, but again, thank you very much for your attendance and the seriousness with which you have addressed all of our petitions today. Okay, thank you. Um, I will spend very briefly to allow you to leave. order because we also have to reflect on the evidence that we've heard today. Can I just say, I should have said at the beginning, I want to thank all of those who provide submissions to the committee. It's quite a significant number um, of people who have responded to the petition who have an interest in it, and that's been helpful to our consideration. Um, and again, I think subsequent to the evidence from the Cabinet Secretary and our colleagues, we would want to invite the petitioner to respond to the evidence that's heard. And again, to other people who have an interest may want to respond to what they've heard to. Um, I wonder if there's any other comments or actions we want to take. Brian? Yeah, I think that, uh, firstly, to, 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 to the petitioner, the, uh, the importance of, of uh, bringing petitions to the committee um, and how that raises uh, awareness of these, these kind of uh, uh, issues um, is very evident today and in and itself is, is going to be really helpful. But I think there's two, two things for me. There's, there's the one side of it is, is the continued uh, research and search into treatment uh, of ME, but probably the thing that we could impact the most right here, right now, is, is trying to go over this hurdle of um, medical practitioners who deny the existence of ME. And I think that there are uh, obviously some very specific uh, actions that the government can take to, to, to cover that. And I think that's, that's something I want to, want to put that on record and then look at how, how we as a committee can help to facilitate that or can, uh, can push that along. Okay, anyone else? There is a Royal College of GP online training programme for uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and myelagic encephalomyelitis, so it would be interesting to see what the uptake of the GPs um, is for that online training programme. Mm -hmm. Mark? Yeah, I, mean, I think it pick up on Mr Whittle's point. I think it is still a concern that 80% of neurologists don't see this as a physical condition. So there's a mismatch between what is actually happening on the ground and how this condition is treated and um, and, and, and the commitment to research that we've we've heard from the Cabinet Secretary and others this morning. I think the research is significant. The area that we didn't really focus on was um, and one question which I think we can direct to government, which is around um, the clinical nurse specialist role. They describe it as pivotal, but there's only one clinical nurse specialist for people with ME in Scotland, um, and none of the additional investment has gone towards nurses for people with ME. So I think that's something that we would want... Um, to ask. Um, obviously, we're, we're conscious of the pressures on the, the Cabinet Secretary's time, but I think if we can get response from the petitioner, any others who are interested in very specifically around this question of GP uptake um, and the role of the specialist nurses and their, whether there's actually sufficient of them. And I guess you know the, the point that Mark Ruskell also made about the level of support there is out in the system, which is not clinical support, but the other kinds of support would be interesting to know as well. Is there anything else? No, in that case, can I thank you all very much for your attendance, particularly to our visitors, uh, Emma Harper and Mark Ruskell. And I do think we want to put on record again our appreciation that Cabinet Secretary Hale for Hale spent such a significant amount of time with us on what are very important petitions, but obviously in the future a very small part of our very broad remit. And again, that is very much appreciated. So can I thank you all very much and I'll close the meeting.